So, to get the slides, ah, the slide master is here. Okay, thank you very much. So, good afternoon, and I will try to uh, continue abusing this lovely afternoon uh, by being indoors instead of enjoying the outdoors and look at uh, yet another subject. In this case, the practical application of fundamental rights in the uh, foreign, common foreign uh, and security policy of the EU with special focus on the use of sanctions or rather, as the politically correct term now is, temporary restrictions, because uh, people might get confused by the word sanctions and think that uh, you actually meant sanctions. Uh, I'm not really convinced by the political correctness because I believe they are sanctions, and that's actually the main point uh, that I'm making this afternoon. And I should underline that even though I serve in different capacities at the European Court, in front of the European Court as a practicing lawyer, and at this university as a researcher, it is in the latter capacity that I'm speaking today. So I'm representing the academic point of view. I'm not uh, speaking from an institutional or party point of view. So, first of all, the legal basis. Let's have a look at it. In a very early case uh, concerning the European Union, they faced the usual problem of wanting to do more than they actually had agreed that they wanted to do, which has been a recurring theme in, in the European Union, that somehow the treaty writers didn't get all of it on paper that later on it was found out that we would like to do. So therefore, the problem was we had what was called in the original treaty, Article 113, on commercial policy. And the question was, if we wanted to adopt uh, some development agreements with uh, third countries, were they then part of commercial policy or were they something separate? And uh, would that then require the use of what is now Article 308 at the time 235 of the EC Treaty, uh, the special legal basis when you run out of other legal basis? And already at that time, the court then took the radical turn of saying, as they later did in other cases, no, 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 you can't go to the special legal basis if you can actually fit it inside. And they therefore came up with the notion that development policy is actually also part of commercial policy, which is a little bit of a funny stance. There's nothing basically wrong with it, but it's again trying to create a little bit more than you act actually add. Now, when we came forward to 2001 and the Yusuf versus uh, European Council case about smart sanctions, we had progressed something because we had actually put into the treaty now in what was then Article 301. Again, we've changed the numbering system, but at the time, Article 301, that we could not only have decisions to have commercial relations with other countries, but we could now also have decisions to break economic relations with other countries, which had also been debated whether that could be done under the old 113, but it had been found that it could be done. And we'd thrown in also, now that we had the free movement of capital, a special provision to say we could also use the rules on free movement of capital to, so to say, sanction other countries. Um, so what the court was now faced with was saying, well, this is what, what we have, but what now if we don't want to sanction a country, but we want to sanction an individual? The treaty doesn't say anything about sanctioning individuals in the form it had at that time. Uh, and the court was therefore again required to try to twist the words into something that could be useful, coming up with a notion that it would not be contrary to the letter of the uh, two articles, and it would be justified by effectiveness and humanitarian concerns, that's almost poetic, uh, that we then said that actually this legal basis about sanctioning other countries, we can expand it into uh, to individuals that are associated with the rulers of a third country. Yeah? Uh, and the court says, now watch, uh, this does not mean that we can, uh, that we can go uh, anywhere we want because what if the regime has been toppled? Can we then still go after people? No, because they are no longer linked to, uh, to that country. But then, of course, uh, in that case, we would not have uh, a sufficient legal basis. Um, but uh, what can we then do? We get out our old friend, Article 235. 
the one we couldn't use in development policy because there was no need for it. But now here we've now clearly established there were limits to the competence of smart sanctions and therefore we could call on Article 308. So either whether we are covered by the legal basis or not covered, we have 308, which is, of course, what has irritated many opponents to the EU, that there was this, as it was referred to, at least in the Danish language, the rubber paragraph, uh, not as in robbing people, but as being expandable and contractable, as you would uh, wish to have it. So where are we today? This should not be a, a course in EU history. Where are, are we today? Well, today we've got Article 24 about the CFSP and the CE, CJEU. It's so terrible, and I... Notice that Inga also preferred still calling it the European Court of Justice because that's a wonderful term in English, whereas the Court of Justice of the European Union is almost unpronounceable and the acronym is no better. But in any case, um, we've maintained the fact that as far as foreign policy is concerned, the court has no competence. Yeah? That's, of course, a strong temptation for the powers that be to term things as foreign policy because then you outside the scope of the nasty court. Uh, but we did actually, in Article 24, say, no, in as far as the two provisions are concerned, the balance between foreign policy and internal market policy, and as far as sanctions are concerned, the court will still have uh, full competence to carry out a, a review. Uh, so what is foreign policy? That must be a definition. Well, it's a rather vague definition. The Council shall adopt decisions that define the approach to geographical or thematic, uh, of a th geographical or thematic nature. That doesn't really tell me anything about where is the borderline between what is foreign policy and what is other policy. But that is what we have. Article 215, the one that was referred to, was to say, or rather which adds to this, is to say, if the, um, the foreign policy should lead to a decision on disrupting or interrupting or reducing relations of an economic character, then we can actually adopt restrictive procedures also against natural and legal persons. And not with any word about them being linked to the rulers of the country. So that means the dilemma that previously required use of Article 308 has been removed. Now we have a legal basis in the TFEU, the Treaty on the Functioning of the European Union, saying if the foreign policy decides that people should be sanctioned, then we can implement it in the basis of the, uh, of the uh, Internal Market Treaty. Article 40 used to be a very strong provision saying uh, that uh, the foreign policy should not encroach on the internal market. We've now made it into a balanced treaty saying that the two should be kept in a mutual respect balance and it's become, in that sense, a rather ineffective pr pr provision. And Article 275, which we talked about, gives the court the power to rule on the legality of decisions concerning smart sanctions. And that's then the real topic coming to the subject of what we're talking about. What are the scopes and limitations? Again, describing the foreign policy... It, color, it covers all areas of foreign policy, all questions related to the Union's security. That, of course, again, is a broad mandate. But let's see where it is. Well, the court in the Kluyev case refers back to an article that we'll be coming back to, Article 21, which is not really about foreign policy. It's about external actions. And here it gets confused because the Commission has decided that its foreign ministry... The European, uh, the European executive, what is it? The external, action the external action service. Thank you very much. The external action service is exactly called uh, um, the external action service, and not the foreign policy service. But the confusing element here is that actually external action, in the EU terminology, is a broader concept because it covers all international relations, not just what you would call foreign policy, but also all other economic and development uh, re uh, relations. So external action is not the same as foreign policy. It's a wider concept. But in any case, uh, what we are allowed to do is to now 
under the scope of, of this Article 2021, to sanction any person who has been found responsible for misappropriation of public funds that are liable to have jeopardized the functioning of the country concerned. So, the Ukrainian minister that has run away with millions of uh, Grivna, we can go after him because his action is liable to have jeopardized the proper function of, of Ukraine, and uh, he has actually been uh, involved in misappropriation of public funds. Uh, and that is underlined by the court to be very important because it is an element of combating corruption and it is something that falls within the scope of the rule of law. So under the heading of rule of law, we can start sanctioning people who have committed serious crime in other countries that we want to support. Uh, however, the court in the uh, Yanukovych case then underlines that of course, it can't be that all of a sudden we can run around and be a version of the US, a policeman on the international scene, addressing whatever issue we want to deal with. So they, it's written explicitly in the Yanukovych case that it's not any old misappropriation of funds that entitles the union to act. It has to be something that is important. It has to be something that is so important that it undermines the legal and institutional foundations. Yeah? Then you start ask, asking the practical questions. Uh, the law firm that I've been working with, we had a case concerning a minister who had been charged with being involved in the transfer of title to a large property situated in the center of Ukraine. And that might be true, that might be not true. The argument we tried to sell to the court unsuccessfully was to say, but the property is still there. Whatever dispute there might have been about who had title to it and who could do one thing or another with it, the one thing that's sure is that the property has not gone away. It's still lying in the same place in the middle of, of Ukraine. So we have some difficulty seeing how the actions were such as to undermine the legal and institutional framework of the Ukraine. Not to say that it was a legal act, possibly, but it was difficult to classify it. The court disagreed on that issue. So, um, the court went on to underline that that has to be reviewed in a broader sense than one might even might initially think about uh, what is undermining the institutional foundations of a country. Uh, so, they widened the scope to, to say it's something that has a negative impact on the so to say, atmosphere of the rule of law. So that means that even though the fact that, in the example I just mentioned, the minister, nobody had claimed he had taken the money away. There was no claim that money had left the country. The property could not leave the country. But there could still be damage on the rule of law concept, the morality of society. And that then all of a sudden becomes enough to be a uh, grounds for sanctions. And this is where everything was going fine in a way, because we all agreed on what was happening. The EU was lending a hand to various countries in, so to say, picking up the pieces after a regime change and getting after the bad guys who had been abusing the country before. But all of a sudden, the court got reservations about this and came up with, in the Almatri case, the lecture that, remember, this is not about sanctions. Because sanctions has that negative effect of all of a sudden saying criminal law. And criminal law all of a sudden says something about rights under the European Convention of Human Rights. So now how do we get out of this one? We do that by saying this is not intended to penalize. No, 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 no. We're not, we're not sanctioning these people. We are just imposing temporary restrictive measures by freezing their bank accounts and denying them visa rights, etc., so as to facilitate that the national authorities can do whatever legal uh, challenge or can undertake whatever legal challenge they want to do it and possibly recovering the misappropriated, misappropriated funds. And that means that the whole procedure is precautionary. The side benefit of that is that, of course, we step outside the ring of criminal law and a lot of the protection in the Human Rights Convention evaporates at the same time. 
Now, in that case, the Almatri case, the lawyers for Almatri made the argument, but listen, the European delegation actually sent a letter to the Tunisian authorities saying, please give us a list of names of people you would like to punish. And we will then help you punishing them by imposing sanctions on them. But the court says, yeah, 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 yeah. But the fact that the, uh, that the delegation might have sent such a letter out, an arm of the European Action Service, uh, that predated the adoption of the, uh, of the actual Sanctions Act. And therefore, there's no relation between the two things. That's, in my book, pretty weak arguing. But we've seen the same in other cases we presented to, to the court that actually this company was sanctioned, an Iranian company, was sanctioned because the council received a letter from one member state, or rather an email from one member state saying, could you please add this company to uh, the list of companies to be sanctioned? And we queried with the council, could you please give us all the documents in the case? And under the freedom of uh, access to information uh, rules, the council replied, this is all we have. So they acknowledged the only piece of paper in front of us when we made the decision was an email from a member state saying, please add this country. It didn't sell to the court. So anyhow, moving on. In Almatri, it's made clear, just in case you didn't get the point I was making, there is no criminal law aspect, and therefore it cannot be reviewed in the same way as a criminal law decision made by a national court. Consequently, the court says uh, they're not the same. The European court and the council uh, are not in the same situation as a national uh, judicial institution undertaking criminal sanctions. Now, if we look at something else, if we look briefly at competition law, then you'll see in competition law we try to do the same trick. We've written into the uh, regulation on competition law, the commission can impose sanctions, the commission can impose fines, but they, and they will not be of a criminal nature. Yeah? So that's like I'm saying, you, you are all now sitting at, at the beach. Uh, which you are obviously not, but I have now said you're sitting at the beach, and ergo you are sitting at the beach. So the sanctions are not criminal, ergo they are not criminal. But actually, the court even had to admit that the European Court of Human Rights, in the case referred to, the diagnostics case, said that any de 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 decision on a fine that has a preventive and punitive objective constitutes a criminal issue or a criminal matter. So therefore also the careful wording of the court in the Almatri case, there is no punitive intent yeah, to get around this, this one. But what the court says here is there's no problem. An administrative entity can issue criminal sanctions as long as they are fully reviewable by a court, which of course makes a certain sense. That, this is Strasbourg talking. But then we have to question ourselves, does the European, or sorry, the Court of Justice of the European Union have full review of commission or council decisions? Don't we undertake only a limited administrative re review? Is it not, uh, do we really have one uh, where we do not just verify the procedural legality, but we make assess the proportionality of the choices and all the technical assessments? Maybe we do that in competition law. So maybe we are home safe there. But we don't do that in general in administrative law. In administrative law, we generally say that it's actually the council that has a broad margin of appreciation under which it operates. And for example, in the Almatri case, again, we say explicitly the council does not have an obligation to investigate. When it gets information from the Ukrainian general prosecutor, it may rely on that information. It doesn't have to go out and check it. Uh, it. It has received it. It's the highest authority in Ukraine. It might be that some people claim that Ukraine is a corrupt country, but this is the highest judicial authority. So, of course, the council can rely on it when they get the shopping list of who to sanction. We did manage, in a case before the court, actually to, 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 to say that 
if, I'll get the court to, to rule, if it is made clear that there is a potential violation of a core EU principle, such as maybe it's in Eden, then all of a sudden the council wakes up, or has to wake up, and carry out a check. So in this case, the lawyers of Mr. Stavitsky had made the claim, but the issues that he's now being sanctioned for have already been ruled upon by a Ukrainian court 10 years ago, who found there was no issue. So now to start proceedings again would be a violation of Nebis and Edom, and therefore not acceptable, and therefore there is no basis for, uh, for the EU to adopt sanctions, and that, the court said, that is something that has to be taken into consideration. Okay, so this was something about when can, can we actually apply sanctions, what are we doing when we are applying sanctions or imposing temporary restrictive measures. The second issue, much shorter, but we are still on time, deals with the statement of reasons. One of the fundamental rules of the EU, any act of the EU must be accompanied by a statement of reasons. It says so, explicitly legal acts shall state the reasons on which they are based. Okay? Here is the decision 2014-119, that is the foreign policy decision on imposing sanctions in Ukraine. It says, persons identified as responsible for misappropriation. That was what it said originally, but that became difficult, because how the hell, sorry my language, was the council to decide who was responsible for misappropriation? So some genius revised the text. So it says, Persons responsible shall include any person who is the subject of an investigation. Yeah? So persons responsible for bank robbery are any person who is suspected of bank robbery. That's kind of shifting sands in a way. But never mind, this is in the legal basis in the Act of the European Union. Now, the Charter says also that you have to give uh, reasons. So we add to the Treaty 296, we add Article 41 of the Charter, that the administration must give reasons for its decisions. So now let's look at what decision, what reasons did the council give for the listing of a specific minister. They made the list, the reasoning that this person was subject to criminal proceedings by the misappropriation, for the misappropriation of funds. In other words, more or less copy-paste of the legal text saying you are suspected or, or the basis for you to be listed as bank robbery because you are suspected of bank robbery, which is what we wrote in the, in the legal text, which actually the court had taken case, uh, position on in a completely different environment, a case where it said a statement of reasons cannot be a stereotypical formulation modelled on the drafting of legal provisions. So exactly that formulation is something the court already said, you cannot do it this way. But if that were true, then all of a sudden the council would have a problem because all of their decisions on sanctions are written in the same format. One-liners, person subject to investigation, etc., copy-paste the text. So the court had to come up with another reason. Uh, to this you could add that the court has also in a case called uh, Alliance 1 ruled that a statement of reasons must be given in principle at the time of the decision. You can't come at another time and add with the reasons for why you took it as an afterthought, yeah? and especially not in the, uh, in the Alliance 1 case during the actual court hearing. So uh, what did the court then come to to say in relation to sanctions? Well, the court said, actually, when we're talking about sanctions, you have to look at the statement of reasons in the context of the relations between the parties. So in other words, it's a bit like I say to you, you get a shop, you, you get a fine for shoplifting. And you say, what? And I say, oh, but we've been talking about this for several years. So you know exactly what I'm, what I'm talking about. You, you know all the reasons for why I'm now giving you a fine. If the commission tried that one in a, in a competition case, saying you get a fine for anti-competitive behavior, 
uh, and you know the reasons very well because we've been writing together with you on several occasions, that gets thrown out of court. They have to make, and they have to make a decision on imposing a fine. It has to have a, uh, a presentation of the facts, of the legal analysis, etc., and that's the document that gets reviewed by the court. But here the court says in relation to sanctions, no, 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 the person who was being sanctioned, he already knew from previous correspondence what this case was about, so that, that was enough. He, he, was, he was put in a position where he could uh, ascertain whether there were reasons to undertake a review. You can hear that I'm not deeply convinced by the line of... Uh, of, of reasoning. And even more when the court then feels the need to say, actually we must weigh the requirement of a statement against the practical realities. Yeah? I mean, again, imagine a national authority saying to the European, uh, to the Court of Justice of the European Union, we are very sorry that we didn't fully live up to uh, the EU requirements, but we actually have a lot of work to do here. So we are rather understaffed. We don't really have the time to go into all these issues. Again, they'll be thrown out of court. There are several cases that establish that it is no excuse that the national administration was not able to handle this or, uh, or that. There was still a violation of EU law. But here we are told that we have to weigh it against the practical reality of what the Council can actually undertake. So, since all of that had been known to, to the person in the Stavitsky case, there was nothing uh, to, to take, uh, to take uh, uh, care of. And they even add a little bit of insult to it, saying that here it was clear, the statement of the reason said that he was subject to criminal proceedings and therefore he was being sanctioned, and that was the end of the story. Okay especially for a person who was trying to claim that he had actually been cleared. So, just as a comparison before we come to the conclusion, the Commission, many years ago, tried suing Denmark, and the Commission made a mess of it. So they wrote in their, in their formal letter of notice, and in their recent opinion, that the Danish law, Article 18, actually violated EU law. And then they had a think, and they realized... Ah, it was not the law, but it was the ministerial decree adopted under the law where Article 18 violated EU law. And therefore, when they came to the court, they said, we have a little correction. It's actually not the law, but it's the decree. And there the court stayed on the high horse and said, no, 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 this is well established. The applicant, the commission, cannot come at such a late stage and change the basis of the case. That would violate the rights of defense of the defendant who have now prepared for a defense concerning Article 18 in the law and are completely unprepared for a defense concerning Article 18 of the, of the de decree. Do you really believe that the Danes were so dumb that they didn't know that it was Article 18 of the decree that was the problem, even though the commission managed to make a mistake and write the law? Of course not. They were fully aware of it. But here the court focused on the formal requirements of the procedure. If you don't get it right, then you can't remedy it at a later stage. Not applicable, apparently, to sanctions. So, the conclusion. What can we do better? What can we do different? Well, if we look at uh, the chapter or the title, Title 5, which is the main section of, of the Treaty on External Action and Common and Foreign Security Policy, it has a chapter one and chapter two, the specific provisions on the foreign policy and the general provisions on the external action. And in that, Article 21, the one we started with, quite correctly says that international cooperation can concern all of these issues, democracy, rule of law, human rights, international law. So it can be addressed both in foreign policy and in other external action. And still, in the general chapter on external action, within external action, we can identify interests and objectives, and uh, they can relate to common foreign and security policy, as well as other areas of the external action. And what can we then do? We can enter into international agreements with various countries, and then implement it according to the TFEU. 
And in the TFEU, it's Article 212, which says that we can enter into technical cooperation agreements with third countries within the frameworks and the principles and objectives of the external action. So a direct reference back to 21. So where am I getting with this? I'm getting to the argument, we'll skip this one, I'm getting to the argument that we have actually done it. So instead of having a situation where in Tunisia, where in the Ukraine, where in various places in the world where we think that there is a post-regime change problem, where we could help the Tunisians or the Ukrainians or whoever else with pursuing ex-ministers who were corrupt during their regime, we could actually do it as an international corporation. We could set up an agreement with Ukraine saying we will enter into a criminal law procedure cooperation with you. No need for the foreign ministers to, to sit and weigh something they don't understand about. We'll get our police authorities, we'll get our judicial authorities to cooperate. And we've done it. We've done it with the USA. Of course, you can say it's a little bit different making an agreement with the USA than with, say, Tunis. But still, in 2003, based on, at the time, different provisions, at the time we didn't have an external action provision, so therefore we had only a foreign policy provision, but then we did have a specific provision of police cooperation saying that vehicle can be used also for police agreements. That didn't make them foreign policy. That was just a simplified way of writing the, the treaty at the time, even though it was perhaps a little bit con confusion. So what's the point that I've been arguing today? The point I've been trying to make is that the route the EU has taken, the route that the court has allowed the EU to take, has led it into a situation that in order to get smart sanctions to work, it's been necessary to say, first of all, they're not sanctions. They're just temporary restrictions. Let's get them out of the scope of Strasbourg because they're not matters of criminal law. The obligation to state reasons, which is one of the most fundamental principles of EU administrative law, well, we'll bend it a bit to get it to fit the technical difficulties of actually handling sanctions cases. And the fact that third countries come with shopping lists, we would like to have the following people sanctioned. No, 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 that does not... That does not disrupt our impartiality. We are uniquely ourselves, for foreign policy reasons, deciding whom we will sanction. And I say, I have some difficulties here. I don't see why we need to go out on the thin ice. Because we could go out on perfectly solid, one meter thick uh, Latvian winter ice by saying, let's skip all this. If we want to help the new regime in Tunisia, the new regime in Ukraine, we make an international cooperation agreement. We have the legal basis, and we could do it. But nobody wants to go that route, because it is, of course, a lot, much more, can you say, technically complicated route to go than to have the Foreign Policy Committee meet and decide, yeah, let's do that. We got the email saying, let's put them on the list. Let's do that. Uh, and that's why I find that the result is unsatisfactory. And let me just at the end, especially for the benefit of the tape, underline all of these comments are made in a purely academic context. Thank you very much. Any questions to Peter? No. Maybe then I will ask you a question. How can you say what is the impact of the Charter of Fundamental Rights of the EU on uh, court jurisdiction in CS CFSP matters? Has it changed after uh, Charter has gained the legally binding force? What has changed in, in, in that? Specifically in the field of uh, the imposition of so-called smart sanctions. Uh, which are these targeted sanctions, instead of going after a country and disrupting trade relations in the country in general, but to target individuals who can be seen as responsible or having formerly been responsible, I don't see a lot of impact. Uh, because essentially, uh, the case law, in my appreciation, has been one that has mainly avoided the issue of the rights of the targeted person, except for, of course, the very famous line of jurisprudence concerning Mr. Cardi, where the general court 
with all due respect, got it wrong and in the first Carty judgment said, if the United Nations has decided that Mr. Carty is to be sanctioned, then who are we, the General Court of the European Union, to second guess whether that was uh, correct or not? And where the General Court, uh, sorry, where the Court of Justice on appeal said, no, 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 no. Since the EU will be imposing sanctions, then the EU has its own responsibility for doing so and therefore it must carry out an uh, assessment. Uh, but at the practical level, I would say my experience, if I turn then to a different role, step over here instead, my experience in trying to convince the general court of, uh, mis of uh, incorrect uh, application of procedure has, for me at least, demonstrated that the only places that we could have any chance of success was if we could prove that the facts were wrong. If we could somehow put on the table that the facts were wrong. But again, here we come to, uh, to an important difference between EU law and, for example, criminal procedure. If you are convicted of murdering your husband, I don't even know if you have one, but you are convicted of murdering him, I can at any time come and say, no, 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 now I've got the DNA proof, or I've, I've got something I can get the case reopened. We, we can assess, were you actually responsible or not? That, that becomes the core element of the, of the judicial um, uh, assessment. That is not the case in EU administrative law. EU administrative law sets out to assess, were the council, based on the information that was available to it at the time, entitled to believe that what they were doing were correct? That is a much, much more limited uh, assessment. And that means that the fact that we come later and say, but actually it turned out that you, there was a wrong guy, the facts were wrong, etc. Ah, but did you tell the council at the time, before they made their decision? No, you didn't. Well, then they were justified in making their decision. Which, of course, is again something that promotes efficiency of administrative decision making. <coughs> but it's not something that promotes... Uh, so to say, legal certainty for the persons who are involved. And that's where it comes back to bite. Uh, that concern, of course, evaporates if we say this has nothing to do with criminal law. Then we are outside the scope of all, all these protections that we find in the Human Rights Convention and also in the Charter. But if we say, but that's actually not true, this is criminal law, then all of a sudden they snap back into place and then we question, are these mechanisms sufficient? That would be my answer to it. Yeah? Thank you. Uh, like following what you are yep. telling now, and um, the person who yep. was charged uh, in Ukraine, Tunisia, yep. doesn't matter, were for a like yep. criminal case, yep. but uh, it wasn't uh, wasn't uh, set to, like set to the jail, so the the, the case mm -hmm. didn't was wasn't closed. But the point is, like, if the person it was enlisted in this sanction or restriction list, but later on uh, the person can prove that uh, it, it was innocent. Yeah. So towards whom should this person uh, move on? Towards yeah. the Ukrainian government or the EU court? And uh, how yeah. to like recover yeah. if, if it was like some f financial yeah. restricts? So yeah. how, how the person can recover this, yeah. you know, the costs and uh, losses? The person who was subjected to EU sanctions, if it was established that these sanctions were not legal, would be able to submit a, uh, a claim for, uh, for damages against the European Union for the cost. But that would, of course, mean that that person would have, to be would have to establish what were the actual losses that he or she suffered because of the uh, listing, which basically comprises a travel restriction inside the EU, a cooperation restriction with EU partners, and a freezing of any money they may or may not have in, uh, in European banks, which is, of course, why some of it looks a little bit like a joking matter, like, for example, following the intervention, or whatever you want to call it, in eastern Ukraine, one of the persons to get sanctioned was the admiral of the uh, Russian Black Sea Fleet. 
So all his investment in Western Europe was, was frozen. I don't think he had any. I can't imagine that, that he would have any. He was no longer allowed to travel on holiday to, uh, to Western Europe. I don't think he would be under, under uh, Soviet, uh, Russian military rule in, uh, anyhow. So in that sense, it becomes more flag-waving. Yeah? But for a businessman, of course, it becomes something that, that can have an impact. But the problem becomes, what would he have to do? He would have to challenge the legality of the EU sanctions. And that he could do only, A, within a two-month period, set in Article 263. And he, would, uh, and, and he would have to challenge it on the basis that the council should have known better at the time. Not that now it has been found out that the council was actually wrong. No, you have to prove the standard the council should have known better at the time. A claim for damages is in principle independent of a claim for annulment, but you cannot use a claim for damages to come to circumvent the fact that you did not act within the, uh, the, the two-month period. And that, of course, makes it even more difficult for uh, people who are sanctioned because the sanctioned decisions are typically made on a one-year rolling basis. So that means you're sanctioned in... 2014. You get your lawyers to act within two months. A court case starts. It takes typically two years. Well, it's become better at the general court. We're down to, what, one and a half year uh, or something like that. But that means we start in 2014. We'll probably get a judgment in 2016. But in the meantime, your sanctions have been renewed in 2015, so we get the second case. And by the time we are ready to get the judgment in 2016, you've been renewed for the third time, and we get the third case rolling. It becomes an enormous web that all of a sudden you're, you're, you're caught in, and of course, with, uh, with legal costs. Uh, but uh, but that, the other option is, of course, that the, uh, the person could go to the home country and get cleared. But explain to a um, Ukrainian ex-minister Listen, there's no problem. You just travel back to Kiev and go to court and explain that there was no problem, and then, of course, there will be no problem. Uh, he will think you are uh, crazy. Uh, he got out of Ukraine, and he's never going to go back to, uh, to Ukraine uh, as long as uh, things haven't changed back to, to the way he liked them to be or, or she liked them to be. But also, the, like the point, uh, if the person, uh, yeah. you know, uh, like... Get some, some, you know, compensation. Yeah. Like, should the EU court ask for, I don't know, government or responsible person who gave this information? Like, uh, like you said before, like an example, like this, yeah. this company should be on, on a list. Yeah. Like, uh, should the court ask those no. authorities no. to compensate? No, no, no. There would be no basis for that. The court, the court, the the EU council must must carry its own responsibility for the decision it makes based on the information that is available to it. So you know, there, there, would be no, there would be no rollback of, of a liability. So my question is, so even if you convince us, and you convince and we argue that there is something yeah. fishy with the, the system as it yeah. existing with the sanctions, but the agreements on criminal procedural uh, cooperation, what would be in them? And We've got all we've got all of this inside of the EU. We've got the European arrest law. We've, we've got the European freezing orders. Uh, so we've got a f sorry, we've got a full set of mechanisms inside the EU for cross-border cooperation between uh, prosecution and police authorities, and we have the possibility of expanding that to uh, to. Uh, to cooperation with third countries. And we've done that with the US, and we could do that with other countries. And that means that instead of being a foreign policy issue where the ministers of foreign affairs are discussing which persons to go after in the Ukraine, it would be, in that case, then the Ukraine prosecutor general sending a request under the cooperation agreement to, to the EU if the EU could please take steps to in, in, ensure the freezing of uh, monies, the arrest and the extradition of the person if the person should be found within uh, the EU territory, uh, which would be, in some ways, I would argue, a fundamental rights safer approach because then you are letting the authorities who are supposed to deal with suspicion and prosecution 
of persons deal with that issue also in an international cooperation. Of course, one of the objections would, would be, but how can we enter into cooperation with the, uh, with the police authorities of Silostan, to mention a fictional country without insulting any, anybody, but that argument then turns 180 degrees back and saying, well, if you can't enter into an agreement with them about cooperation, how can you be smart sanctioning people based on information and requests coming from the authorities of Silverstone? So you can't have it both ways. Uh, and if you can't have it both ways, then I believe that the authorized cooperation between relevant authorities is a better way forward. It is more protective of the fundamental rights of the persons involved because it follows the, uh, the, uh, the normal procedures. Not to say that everything immediately becomes beautiful because we have the same problem in the e EU. As you know, all the resistance there has been with the European arrest warrant, uh, the deep mistrust uh, of authorities, such as, uh, for example, in the old Central Com case concerning the uh, restriction on export of goods to what was at the time the dissolving Yugoslavia where the British authorities took the point of view that we cannot release funds kept in Britain for exports that are made from Italy to, uh, to ex-Yugoslavia, which can only legally be done with medical supplies. But, of course, it's not just medical supplies going out, out of Italy. It's probably much more, because you know how Italians are. Yeah? They're sloppy, lazy, and, and, and corrupt. Uh, that was the argumentation of, of the British uh, uh, authorities and to which the court looked at them very indignantly and said, but you can't have that kind of preconceptions about other countries. Unless you come with a specific case where you can prove that something was not medicine, then you are bound by the loyalty ob obligation in the EU treaties to presume, to expect that whatever the Italian authorities are doing is correct and therefore you have to be able to release the funds in the UK banks. And the same applies. If you think that you can rely on the Prosecutor General of, of Ukraine as the highest judicial authorities in the country, and the council does not need to check the information he provides, well, fine. Then you've just made a statement that we have a perfect basis for a close technical co cooperation, which I would then prefer to move into the hands of the professionals that are used to that kind of work rather than the, the uh, European External Action Service. That's the whole argument. Thank you. <laughs>